Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. It's Saturday. We are a couple of days behind, but we are going to chip away at that today and tomorrow. If you're watching on YouTube, you know the drill. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell. If you want notifications of when I post new content, click the little bell icon. It'll send you an alert. Music fact of the day. The song Beast of Burden by the Rolling Stones. Keith Richards explained this is about a time in his life where he was away from the band to work on his issue with addiction. He said, when I returned to the fold after closing down the laboratory, as he calls it, I came back to the studio with Mick to say, thanks, man, for shouldering the burden. That's why I wrote Beast of Burden for him, I realize in retrospect. It's been a crazy couple of days in this trial. On day six, we started out with an armorer that knows his stuff. Also, Dave Halls took the stand, and then at the end of the day, Sarah did. What I'm going to do is on the next episode, I'm going to do all of her testimony. She wasn't on the stand a very long time before they broke for the day. So instead of doing 10 minutes of her testimony, We'll do that all in the next one. I'm going to put some pictures up. These are just some examples of unsafe handling of firearms on set. A lot of it's what they call muzzle control. You see the gun is pointed at the young actor, the child actor on set, right in the face. There is a photo there in the bottom middle of Hannah holding a shotgun with the butt of it on the ground and the muzzle up towards her face. She's gripping the end of the barrel. And you just see where there were so many potentials for accidents to happen on this set. In the background here, while we're talking about the armorer's testimony, I'm just going to play it. There are some clips from the movie in there that were kind of behind the scenes when they're rehearsing that he was using as a reference to these unsafe weapon positions and just carelessness. His name is Brian Carpenter, and he's the owner of 13S Productions. He's an ex-police officer from New Orleans. He did SWAT during Katrina, Hurricane Rita, and then also during the cleanup and the restorations. He's a securities contractor and an armorer. He said in New Orleans, someone asked if he wanted to be a bodyguard for a film. And at first he said no, but eventually he said yes. And it was for a Denzel Washington project called Deja Vu. He's been an armorer on around 100 projects. He's an expert witness in firearm safety on film sets. The armorer's number one priority, obviously, is safety, also to help the look and the feel of the film. When they receive any items from the film from a supplier, there's an audit and then a safety check on everything that comes in. An armorer can call cut, and the three most dangerous areas on a set are stunts, special effects, and the armor department. Armorer, he confirms, falls under the prop department. He's had to take weapons away most frequently in the stunt department, but he's never had to take a gun away from an actor. He gives an example of having to change around a scene in a small hotel room where all of the characters were firing weapons. Ultimately, he decided it was too close of a space and they wouldn't be able to do that in one take. He explains you may not be the most popular person on the set when you do stuff like this, but at the end of the day, the armorer's job is to make sure everybody goes home safely. He carries everything to set in a lockbox and you only take out your weapon when they're prepping and they've called the actors to the set. You clear that with two representatives on set, the director of photography, in this case, would have been Miss Hutchins, and the first assistant director, Dave Halls. You take out the dummy rounds for a visual and an audible inspection by shaking those rounds. Then he shows the dummy rounds individually. This is done again when the actor gets on set if they want it. You don't hand the gun to the actor until right before the camera starts rolling. And as long as nobody leaves the set and nothing changes, they can hold the gun if they're doing a quick turnaround or reshoot that scene. But if the actor walks off set and then comes back, that whole process starts over. The armorer should never leave when there's a live gun on set. Leaving a gun and walking away just opens the door to accidents because you have no management of that gun. The gun could be dropped and damaged. Someone have blank rounds in their pocket and load it, pointing it at someone. It's an endless list of things that could potentially go wrong. He said, a movie with a machine gun that shoots thousands of rounds a day, he'll tape the top and then he will mark on there how many rounds were in there. In a Western, he carries ammo in a magazine and dummies in a locked Pelican box. It's all part of a kit he brings to set. It's not provided. 
He agrees that film sets are rushed because time is money. If you don't have your things in order, you're spending money. And he also agrees that rushing can affect the armorer. His mentor told him, if you're being rushed, you slow down twice as much. You stop, take a breath, because you're getting into an atmosphere of unsafe behavior. You could have a misstep, you overlook things. He said it's possible by raising his voice and saying, we need to slow down. You can lose your job. But he said for the most part, the cast and crew listens to him and he's never lost his job because of that. They asked him about a fanny pack and he said you can carry it any way you want as far as the ammo. He doesn't do it that way. But dummy rounds are meant to recreate the look of a real round. And he has them in an area where he's in 100% control of the ammunition and bags and pockets just don't allow for that control. The armorer should never leave the gun with the assistant director because you can't be in control of the weapon. You have to observe the weapon at all times. And if that firearm is live and on set, you don't leave. As far as accidental discharges, they talk about Hannah not being in control of the weapons when they were discharged. But ultimately, the responsibility is with the armorer for creating that environment that allowed the discharge. And also, whoever created the discharge could be at fault. Blanks and dummies should be locked up, and it should have a chain of custody. More hands on it just opens the door for accidents. Some prop masters are also armorers. You can be licensed on someone else's license. If they're trained, then that's okay. A prop master like Sarah who has never shot a gun before, should not be loading and unloading firearms. They talk about training. He says 10 minutes is not enough time to adequately train somebody. He prefers 40 hours of training at minimum. Doesn't always get it, but that's what he likes. They ask about right before Miss Hutchins was shot, how she walked in and opened the gun and spin that cylinder for Mr. Halls. He said it's just not appropriate. You cannot identify the rounds in there. They play some behind the scenes footage. You just see all these safety issues. You got muzzles pointing at people. There were three times I counted in the face of the child actor on set. At one point, the stunt double hands the gun to the kid. The kid points it. You see the stunt double tell him not to do that. We see Hannah with the butt of the gun on the ground, gripping the barrel and the muzzles pointed pretty close to her face. In another, she walks into view with the gun in the same position, but she's walking. Stunt doubles talking to crew, using the gun to point as he's talking. Sometimes you see Hannah in the video, sometimes you don't. He also saw weapon exchanges in that footage without safety checks. Obviously, he said muzzle control is a huge issue on this set. That should be pointed at the ground. At one point, it's pointed at the director, Joel. And if she was on set, she should have told these actors to put that muzzle down on the ground. If it's repetitive and after you explain to whoever is handling that gun inappropriately and it doesn't change, you take the gun away. Also, with a child actor on set, you should be hyper vigilant. If an armor isn't following the safety rules, it would be hard to implement safety on set as a whole. If you have several actors on set with guns between takes, you take the guns. And if you can't, you hire people to help you. He mentions on this set, he would have had at least two armorers due to the number of guns at any given time on set. They show a scene with Baldwin. He comes out of a building and his guns are just blazing. Baldwin says, one more reload quickly. The witness says it shows a full flash blank. One of the first rounds Baldwin fired covered the camera operator and the camera in smoke. And that means that Baldwin was in the safety zone and firing at the camera. He said that Baldwin should have been aiming four feet to the side of the camera and about 20 feet away. He said they instruct actors to aim away from the camera, but they do set up very controlled shots where the gun sometimes has to be pointed directly at the camera. In another shot, Baldwin is laying on the ground. The gun is loaded with full flash blanks. He's talking to the crew about how he wants to film this scene, and then he's pointing the pistol at the crew as he's explaining. Hannah did speak up at this point and told the crew to move. She should have also corrected Baldwin. The direction of where he was firing should have been established before the scene. There would have been about six to ten crew members behind that camera in a scene like this, which just puts them in the line of fire should something go wrong. He mentions that Baldwin's also directing Armour what to do. He said this is a moment where he personally would say we're going to slow down, and you've got Alec telling them to hurry up and restart. 
He said a reload should never be rushed. You hear somebody in the background, they don't specify who it is, telling Hannah you should have had two guns and both were reloading. Hannah is digging in her fanny pack. You see she's very, very rushed. And the first AD walks up. The first AD, Mr. Halls, is seen walking off as she is reloading very quickly. But the armorer points out this should have been a safety check on the rounds as she's reloading. They show another scene. They yell cut. After they yell cut, Baldwin fires off a round and says a curse word. He talks about blanks being dangerous. They did this test on soft tissue impact from all the blanks and the effect on soft tissue. A full flash blank fired from six to eight feet can peel your skin off. Even a half flash can damage human tissue. He said not having your ammunition sequestered is just a setup for an accident. With Hannah's inexperience, once you take on the responsibility for the safety of everybody on set, you have to take charge. Her experience level on this film did not work in the favor of the set and the safety of the set. He said ultimately she took the position and people on the set trusted that she would keep them safe. On cross-exam, the defense attorney just points out that there should have been two armorers on that set at all times, given the number of firearms. And he can't say for sure that Hannah didn't tell people to control their muzzles. There's no specific requirement for licensing in the industry for armorers. Other than guidelines that are put out by the industry, there's no other official requirements. I think that really has to change. I think you need a very long and lengthy background in some kind of field where you deal with firearms on a regular basis. Other than that, the only thing a new armorer would really have to follow are the Cooper rules. What are those? It's kind of like your four basic rules of gun safety. Always point the gun in a safe direction. Keep your finger off the trigger unless you're ready to shoot. Always keep the gun unloaded until it's ready to use. And know your target as well as what's beyond your target. They go back to training and said it's not advisable to train a lot of people at once. But you can, depending on how comfortable some of the cast and crew are with weapons. It also depends on the complexity of the weapons that'll be used in the film. You should have a safety briefing each day that a firearm is going to be used on set. And the defense points out in that one scene, Baldwin rushing everybody, saying to go, 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 reload quickly. The armor agrees it would have been a difficult situation for Hannah to go in and tell an A-list actor to slow down. But ultimately, you have to. The defense also points out that Mr. Halls didn't say anything either. He's asked about the photo of Hannah holding that muzzle of the shotgun right at her face. And the defense asked if from that angle, you could tell if it was close to her face or not. The witness just says it should have been pointed with the muzzle down to the ground regardless of how close it was to her face. He did inspect dummy rounds from the set and said they were all pretty low quality. The defense asked about a specific company that makes dummy rounds. It's a Mexican company that does replicas and they ask about one of the projectiles being from that company. The witness said those really are not built to industry standard. They're more for display cases if you were to get a replica gun. You can also display replica ammo of what would go in that gun. And he says with the different types of dummy rounds, some rattle, some don't, and that's just not a safe situation. So on redirect, the prosecution says, would you hold a shotgun pointed to your head? He says, no. Would you let a stuntman hand a minor a shotgun? No. They point out Hannah did not intervene with what we saw in the videos, and we did not hear her voice off camera. He knows of Hannah's dad, Thel Reed, he works in a very specific genre and is known in the industry. She asked, was it a low quality dummy round that killed Miss Hutchins? And he said, no. They ask, whose job is it to weed out live rounds on the set? 100% the armorer. He has discovered live rounds on set before. He was a day player. And because the prop master had a health issue and had to leave, he was called back to work. He didn't know what all they had. So the first thing you do is you go through everything. And he picked up a box that seemed heavier than what the dummy round should feel like. It had live ammo that was used for set decoration. What he did with that was dissected those rounds and found out, in fact, it's live rounds. He stopped production and got rid of everything and then brought all new stuff in so that he could have control of it. He said he just found it by doing his inventory. They also point out the day that Miss Hutchin was shot and killed and Joel injured it was an armor day for Hannah. They had a couple of producers come up and testify, and essentially they both worked on the budget side of things. The reason they brought these two on is because in an OSHA hearing, Hannah said that she had asked these two producers specifically for more safety training days, 
and they do not recall having the conversation with her and said they would have. The next witness was John Ziello. He was a crew member. I've watched his interview the day of the shooting. It, he was so sad. It just broke my heart. He's a, he seems like such a nice man. He did have concerns about safety. He'd seen the prop cart twice unattended with firearms and ammo on that cart. He's never seen that before on set. And they had a large scene in the main part of the town set. There were a ton of guns in the scene. He stood next to an actor who still had his pistol in his holster. The actor was not in that scene. And he was playing with the gun and mentioned to the actor, don't shoot me. Hannah wasn't on set, by the way. That should have been taken back by the armorer until the actor was ready for that next scene. He talked about having his truck on set. And that day, he drove himself back from lunch and gave Miss Hutchins a ride as well. He dropped her in front of the church. He wasn't inside when the shooting happened, but he did hear them yelling to call 911. So he was about 100 yards away, and then he ran in. He saw Miss Hutchins on the floor being worked on by the medic. He also saw Joel on the floor. So he just started moving the pews and the dolly out of the way. He was directly involved in helping Miss Hutchins. The medic had trouble keeping oxygen on her face because she was swatting it off. He, the gaffer, Serge and Reed were helping to just stabilize her. He was holding her head. Other people had her arms and legs. She was bleeding. She was in pain. And he did see both that entry and exit wound. Again, did not see Hannah in there. He eventually left the church because they were calling the helicopter and needed a landing zone cleared. So he asked the water truck to clear a landing zone. Also, he said he tried to move a cop car and the cop wasn't too happy about that. Outside the church, he did see Dave Halls and Hannah having a conversation. Dave asked to see the pistol and the rounds in it. They were standing over the cart. Hannah and Dave were removing the rounds, and he actually pulled out his cell phone to document this. He knew it would be important, but he was so shaken and flustered, he didn't push record. So the rounds were taken out, shaken, but ended up on the top of that cart. He was interviewed on set that day. He reviewed it and said a statement was inaccurate about a couple of very minor things, nothing major. He said he had just found out Miss Hutchins had died about five minutes before he did that interview. Cross really wasn't super eventful. Dave Halls was the next witness. They have him go through what he does on set. He said he creates the schedule, makes sure things are moving efficiently, makes sure the cast and crew are getting the information they need to know. Also, he was the safety coordinator. He did plead guilty to a misdemeanor of negligent use of a firearm and got six months probation. That ended in October of last year. Up until October 21st, he felt the set was safe and he had no concerns about Hannah's behavior as armorer. Usually when there's a firearm on set, he makes an announcement on Rust. He had a wireless microphone that was connected to a public address speaker. Additionally, he would announce if there was going to be a scene where blanks would be fired. He would announce people needed to get their protective gear if they were in proximity. And also, he would inspect that firearm with the armorer. He said Hannah would show the empty gun and barrel before she loaded it. And it's not acceptable for Hannah to leave when a hot gun is on set. When he did the safety check with her, she would load the gun in front of him. He said he's trying to avoid saying the word shot. By the way, he got very emotional when he said this. He did have contact with Hannah when Baldwin got on set in the church. He said he did not ask Hannah for the gun. And it's normal procedure when first team comes to the set, they announce it. First team is going to be your actors. That alerts all of the different departments who need to be in there, such as wardrobe, hair and makeup, props. And it's also a signal to the armorer to get ready to bring those firearms. He said very shortly after Baldwin got on set, that's when Hannah arrived. He was facing Baldwin, and he said Hannah showed up with the revolver and said, let's do the check. She opened the latch, spin the cylinder, check the barrel. Hannah took a few steps and then gave the gun to Baldwin. He insists the gun was empty when Hannah came in that church. The gun wasn't in the church when he was sitting in for Baldwin in that pew. He explains usually they have stand-ins that match the hair color, the height, the look of the actor. The stand-in for him was there, but because of COVID, Halls wanted to keep the church as closed off as possible. He told people, if you don't need to be in here, don't be in here. He told the stand-in he would just sit in for Baldwin. The state asked him how the gun got loaded. He didn't see her take the gun from Baldwin personally, but she appeared back on set and said she put the dummies in there. She opened the latch to the revolver. He remembers seeing three or four dummy rounds. He doesn't remember Hannah fully rotating that cylinder. He had seen the dummies before, 
And that day he saw them on her cart. He said he let that safety check pass and then she handed it back to Baldwin. He admits he was criminally charged in the case. She gets him to say why he pleaded guilty and he said he was negligent in checking the gun properly. Baldwin was talking to Miss Hutchins about where to point the gun and then the gun went off and he gets very, very emotional. And he says the idea that that was a live round just wasn't computing. He thought a blank had been loaded and it was another accident with blanks. He said Miss Hutchins was about three feet to his left and thinks maybe he was the first person to get to her when she was on the ground. Then he said it could have been somebody else. But he asked if she was okay and Miss Hutchins told him, I can't feel my legs. Remember, that projectile went through her spine. He's sobbing as he says this. He's very disturbed, you can tell, by what happened that day and what he saw. He left to be sure 911 was being called. The set medic got there, started working on her, so he stayed out of the church. He said he needed to know what was in the gun, so he went in the church and got the revolver off the pew, then went to Hannah's cart, which was on the left side of the church, just right around the corner, and he told her to unload it. He saw five dummy rounds and then one shell casing with no projectile. The end of that that was missing was metallic gray. It was completely different looking than all the other dummy rounds. He said it looked more contemporary than the dummies. He doesn't own or shoot guns personally. He said he didn't tell Hannah to leave the church and he didn't realize she had left the church once that firearm was on set. He didn't see her again until they were at the cart. He didn't tell her to put dummies in the gun, and he didn't hear anybody else to tell her to put the dummies in there. Remember, they weren't filming, they were blocking, so it should not have been loaded at all at that point. He said he agreed to testify in this trial because he thinks it's important that Miss Hutchins' husband and son know the truth of what happened, as well as the cast and crew and the motion picture industry as a whole, so that it never happens again. On Cross, they have a jury question. When she unloaded the gun after the shooting, what did you see? He saw five rounds that were dummies and then that one shell casing without a projectile. It was different looking on the end where that primer should be. We know they were silver. The defense reiterates that he felt Hannah did a good job and point out they didn't do safety meetings every day. Hannah did help him with a presentation for day one about gun safety. He was impressed with how she took control and she was very clear and instructive. He was at the training she did and felt the same way about it. They talk about when Baldwin runs up the hill with the child actor, they all cut and then he fires around and says a cuss word. He doesn't remember a lot of the footage that they showed earlier showing the muzzle control was essentially none on that set. Um, he did see those later on during depositions and with attorneys. They talk about those negligent discharges that happened on October 16th. He saw both. One involved Sarah and a stunt double whose name was Blake. He didn't do anything other than say, what the heck's going on in there? On the production report, it lists anything major that happened that day, and he should have reported it. He did communicate on Channel One about it. The defense asked if the armorers have another channel. He said the armorers better have been on channel one. He says props should be on channel one also. Video Village, we've talked about that. He explains a little further. It's a pop-up tent with the sides blacked out so no light can get through. The monitor was around 42 inches. That's where the director and the director of photography, script supervisor can see filming taking place without being on the set. If it were set up that day and the cameraman had not walked off, Miss Hutchins and Joel both would have been in Video Village, but with the camera crew walking, that's why they were in the church. The defense asked if it's possible he did see all the cylinders. He said there was no full rotation of the cylinder. He's asked why he didn't say something, and he said, well, I mean, that's what I admitted to. I did an improper check of the firearm, resulting in that criminal charge and his probation. There's discrepancy over who handed the gun to Baldwin. Baldwin says Halls, but in his initial statement, he said Hannah like she always did. He changed his statement, and they don't know why. The defense points out in the safety advisory bulletin, it says the first AD is responsible for the gun if the armor is not on set. He said in another deposition that Hannah would have to run to her cart and would sometimes ask him to watch the gun. The defense essentially gets him to say yes, he would be responsible for that weapon if he knew Hannah wasn't on set. But his testimony is that he did not know Hannah was offset. Sarah was there when he asked Hannah to unload that gun. He remembers Sarah saying that some of them didn't shake. He also said Hannah was good about calling out blank sizes on set, whether it's a half load, quarter load, full load. 
on redirect, the other time dummy rounds were used. Did you or anyone else ask for the dummy rounds to be loaded into that gun? And he said no. He's asked if he remembers the first time Baldwin changed his story of who actually handed him the gun. He said it was months after the shooting. The prosecutor says, how do you know she's left if she doesn't tell you she's leaving? And he just doesn't know. The prosecution also points out that he had a lot of other responsibilities aside from the gun. That was it for the testimony before Sarah comes in. I have not watched Sarah's testimony yet. I'm going to do that while I'm doing some housework today. I'll bring you that episode tomorrow. Hope you have a good rest of your Saturday. We'll catch up with everything and be ready for Monday. See you soon.